Amen. Well, that's the way it goes with those southern gospel singers. They get done with the singing and they leave. No, they're headed to Children's Church. Pray for Jeb. He's preaching out there in just a moment. And I appreciate my, my kids and love serving the Lord with them. That is the first time that the Biddy Men's Trio has ever sung together. And uh, I'm thrilled to death. I, if you... If you love serving the Lord with your family, things like that just absolutely thrill you. And I love serving the Lord with my family. Appreciate the ministry the Lord's given us, uh, not only here at the church, but in uh, traveling just a little bit and singing and preaching. I certainly do love the ministry and I uh, love my family. All right, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter number 13. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 3. 13 would work too. But it'd be real hard to match up my message with it. Amen. So we'll go to Revelation chapter number 3. Once you've found your place, if you'll stand with me, Revelation chapter 3, we'll begin reading the verse number 14. Uh, not long ago, I preached out of this passage of Scripture and dealt primarily with verse number 20. And uh, we'll deal a little bit with verse 20 toward the end of the message, but uh, deal a good bit more with uh, the first portion of of the scripture that we will read. I want you to pray that God would help us. I know the burden that's on my heart this morning, and the Lord has been uh, stirring this in my heart for many days now, and uh, I'm trusting the Lord to do a work in our church, uh, do a work in our individual lives, do a work in our families. We need the Lord. We're living in the Laodicean church age right now, in that time frame. And uh, there's some things we can see here that I believe will help us. And I'm trusting each one that is here today. Um, I'm trusting that right now you will ask the Lord to speak to your heart individually. Uh, preaching will do no one any good unless they desire for preaching to do them good. Amen. Uh, churches are filled with people that will hear messages this morning through their ears. And it will never affect their heart because they're only listening with their ears. We need hearers today that will listen not only with their ears, but will listen with their heart to what the Lord has for them. And I'm trusting the Lord to do a great work this morning. All right, verse number 14, Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, uh, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness uh, doth not appear, or do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, or he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. I ask you that you would please sort out my thoughts. I pray, Lord, that you would put a gate upon my lips. Let me speak every word I should speak this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would keep me from saying a single word I should not say. I ask you, Lord, that you'd please help us to hear with open ears and open hearts today. And I beg you to do a work that is far greater than myself, far greater than anyone that is here. Lord, do an eternal work today. Revive our homes, revive our hearts. Lord, revive our church, I pray, in the midst of the years. We'll bless you and thank you for it. Lord, no doubt, under the sound of my voice now, there's someone here who has never trusted you as their Savior. I pray that today they would hear the invitation of the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Lord, that you would save them today. I know this message is primarily for the church. Lord, I beg you that you would preach a message to the lost today as well. Lord, that you would call sinners to repentance. I pray, Lord, that you would please touch the saints of God and revive our hearts. We beg you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen 
and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As we look at this passage of Scripture, it is uh, very familiar. Uh, most of you have probably read at some part and some point in time in your life this passage of Scripture. Many of you have heard messages preached. Uh, in fact, if you were here just a few months ago, I preached a message out of this very passage and dealt with it in part. I want to go back by way of introduction and remind you of a couple of things before we get into the heart of the message. Now, this particular message that is being preached, that is being given right now, begins in chapter number 2, verse number 1. We call it the message to the churches or the letters to the churches. Uh, one way you can look at this is just very practically, and that is that these are actual messages to actual churches. When he's writing to the church at Ephesus, that's meaning he's got a message for the church at Ephesus. When he's writing to the church at Smyrna, that means he actually has a message for the church at Smyrna. Now that is a very practical way of looking at this passage of Scripture. However, also you need to look at this passage prophetically because it deals with the entire church age. If you study uh, throughout the church history of, of what we know as the church age, and that is uh, from the time of Christ and to the rapture of the church, that is the church age, the age of grace, if you want to call it that, uh, the age and the time that we're living in right now. I want to thank the Lord that I was born in this age of grace, this time of grace, when the gospel is being preached, when there's avenues and open doors and people are being drawn to repentance. I thank the Lord that I was born during that time. 31 years ago, God dealt with my heart and showed me I was a lost sinner and needed to be born again. And I got saved 31 years ago as just a little boy. And I blessed the day that I... I was born into the kingdom of God. Amen. What a difference it made. I've never been the same. I'm not trying to get over it. I meet some Christians, it's like they're trying to get over getting saved. Amen. I have a problem with that. I mean, if you got what I got when I got saved, when the Lord forgave me and washed me and cleansed me and moved inside of me and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life and given me a home in heaven, I mean, the deal I got, I'm not trying to get out of. Amen. I'm glad that I am saved and so many are trying to get over over their salvation. Well, good luck with that. Uh, in fact, I'll just go ahead and throw this out there. If you can get over your salvation, it's because you're not saved. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the free message. Here's the one that'll cost you, all right? Uh, take that one home with you. But if, if that's the case, if you can just pass it off and say, well, I got saved, but it never really did anything in me, you are scripturally mistaken as to your salvation experience. Amen. Because salvation changes someone. It makes them a new creature. The Holy Ghost of God takes up a boat in their heart, and everything about that person changes. And I, I understand that there are many, and and, and this is something I've been dealing with this week personally, talking with different people. I understand when some people get saved, there is not a massive lifestyle change in their life. For instance, I was saved when I was seven years old. All right, when I was seven years old, I was always at church. I did not suddenly start going to church when I got saved. I had always been going to church. I mean, every, every Sunday morning, it was no option. We didn't take a poll and we didn't, take a, uh, we didn't raise our hands to see who wanted to go and who didn't want to go. We just got up and we got in the car and we went to the house of God Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every re revival meeting, uh, every vacation Bible school when they had visitation, we were there. I'm just simply saying, even at, as a young boy, I was always at church. I didn't suddenly suddenly start going to church. I didn't suddenly, Brother Troy, stop lying. I had been taught not to lie. I had been taught very plainly how not to lie. Somebody say amen right there. You lie and you get caught in that lie and there were consequences. And it wasn't losing the Nintendo and it wasn't not getting, I'll, I'll date myself a little bit, it wasn't putting the Atari away. Amen. There were consequences that you understood if you were caught lying. Somebody say amen that had that those consequences as well. I learned early in life, I do this, I have sudden pain, 
I don't do this, I don't have sudden pain. It wasn't that difficult to figure out. Somebody say amen and help me there. So I understand there was not a great lifestyle change when I got saved, but there was a change that took place inside of me. Now, it wasn't just the morality that had been instilled in me that was operating my life. It was the Holy Ghost in me bearing witness with the Word of God that had been put in me that had changed me from the inside out. And as I progressed in years and grew in years, uh, the Lord began to do much more in my life. And, and, and I thank the Lord for the work that He did. But some of you, when you got saved, you weren't in church. Some of you, you'd never read your Bible. Some of you were perhaps in drugs and in alcohol and many different things in your life. And when you got saved, there was a dramatic change in your life when you got saved. You see, what, you what took place in you was the Holy Ghost changing you just the way he changed me but our actions to begin with were much different so I want to thank the Lord that I'm saved. Amen. I want to thank the Lord that He changed me. Even though the world may not have seen a great change in my lifestyle, there was a change that took place down in that young boy's heart, and I have never been the same since I was saved by the grace of God. So that was my little break there just to tell you I'm glad I'm saved and glad that I was born in the age of grace when the gospel was being preached. Now, as we look through this, as we go back to the church age, let me mention these churches that are mentioned from chapter number two through chapter number three. The church of Ephesus is the first church we come to. Uh, prophetically or in his, historically, you will find that this church and, and the age that it represents was from A.D. 33 to approximately A.D. 100. The word Ephesus, it means to be the desirable one or the fully purposed. And this was the church in the apostolic age. It was on fire for God and, and God was doing a great work and, and the gospel was going out and thousands upon thousands upon thousands were being saved daily as the gospel went out and the church was growing by leaps and bounds but there was a problem in this first uh, this first church age if you will this, uh, this Ephesus church age and that was as they were working as they were laboring the church as a whole was falling out of love with the Savior and the Bible said they left their first love and then the next age we come to is from AD 67 or, or thereabouts to uh, AD 313, and that is the church at Smyrna. The word Smyrna means a myrrh, a spice to bury the dead. There were ten major persecutions during this period of time, multiplied thousands that had died for the gospel's sake during this time. Then we come to the age or the church at Pergamos, that's from 313 to around 500 AD, and that means marriage and elevation. This is where the birth of the Catholic Church is, the marriage of church and state through that religious organization of the Catholic Church, and we see it a established and growing and all of the issues and I'm not here to get I'm not preaching against Catholics I'm not preaching against Mormons I'm not preaching against anybody I'm simply taking you through some historical things right now we do know uh, that uh, this marriage of church and state certainly has caused a lot of problems and still does today in the time that we're living then we come to the church of Thyatira and that's from 500 to 1500 it means a continual sacrifice and again uh, represented here in, in the growth in the religious realm. We see the Catholic Church, we see the sacraments, we see all the sacrifices and the rituals that went on there in this time of, of what we know as the church age. We come to the church at Sardis from 1500 to 1611. It means the red one, the bloody one, and this is the time of the dark ages and what a terrible time in human history that time was. All of the people that died for the gospel's sake. We come to the church at Philadelphia from 1611 to approximately 1900 uh, and that means is the church of brotherly love and there's a great revival during that time. Most of your revivals that you read about happened during that time, that uh, Philadelphia church age time. Then we come to the church at Laodicea which is our subject this morning and that's from uh, around 1900 to the rapture of the church. It is the day that we're living in and the word Laodicea means the people's rights. During 
During this time from 1900 to present day, we have, uh, we have seen politically and, uh, and socially an emphasis on people getting their rights. Now, uh, agree or disagree, that is what we've seen during this age is when we came up with, with women's rights. And, and hallelujah for it. Amen. You say men and women were created equal. I do not believe that in the sense of their creation. Amen. Don't get upset with that. I believe, in fact, women are far superior to men in most cases, to be perfectly honest with you. Amen. Amen. I've been married to a woman for almost 20 years. We're getting ready to celebrate 19 years, but we're rounding up. Once you get to 15, you start rounding up. And I will go on record and not even be embarrassed to say she is far superior in most elements of our life than I am. All right, so I'm by, by no means belittling women in any shape and form, but God created us not equal. He created us differently. He, he created us with both having responsibilities, but when you say equal, that means on a level playing field. And the, the thing is, God put men in a playing field and women in a playing field never on the same field. Right. Amen. Now, that's, that's good preaching, but some of you didn't like it, so I'm going to go on. Amen. And that's not belittling, ladies. And in any way, shape, or form, it's biblically speaking, you study your Bible, we're different. Hallelujah for it. A couple Sunday nights ago, I talked about the differences between man and women. I stand on it. I bless the Lord. I'm not married to someone like me. Amen. I cannot imagine waking up beside myself every morning. Mandy has grace. I do not have Amen. I can't imagine that, and I thank the Lord I don't have to. So now, let us move on. During this era, we've not only seen the rights of women, we've seen uh, civil rights come in during this era, and, and the promotion of civil rights, and everyone being equal, and, and that's an argument all within itself, and I'm not going to get involved in it at all. I do not agree with either side, just to be honest with you. Amen, and, and we can discuss that a little bit later if you want to. But this is the era of civil rights, and now the thing we're fighting now is sodomite rights and the right to for men to marry men and women to marry women. And yes, I use the word sodomite on purpose because that is the biblical term. It is a term that God used, and it is a term that describes the sin that they are committing that is an abomination to God. So we're fighting now sodomite rights. So this is the church age that we're living in. This is the era of the Laodiceans. And I want to preach for just a little while on living in Laodicea. And I trust the Lord will help us in a great way. I want to mention first off the possession of the church or the possession that came to the church. In verse number 14, you will find the Bible says this, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. It's very important that you read it correctly and not just read through. Go with me now back to chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Verse number 8, the angel of the church in Smyrna. Verse number 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos. Verse number 18, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira. Verse number 1 of chapter number 3, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis. Verse number 7 of chapter 3, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. But when we come to verse number 14, the Bible says, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. You see, they had taken possession of the church. These others were just churches in locations. They were the Lord's church. They were in His possession. But now the Laodiceans have taken charge of the church. They've taken the authority of the church. They've taken reign of the church. And they've become possessive of the church itself. And now it is called the church of the Laodiceans. They had forgotten the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to promote man. The purpose of the church is not even primarily to help man. The purpose of the church is to bring glory to God. You say, wait a second, I thought the purpose of the church was to see sinners saved. That's exactly right. But what does a sinner getting saved do? It brings the utmost glory to God. You see, we have a purpose sometimes driving us to see sinners saved, and it's wonderful because we don't want them to go to hell. But you understand, them not going to hell is, is, a, is one thing 
healing of many that happens when someone gets saved. They don't go to hell. Hallelujah. They do go to heaven. But in the entire time, what is happening, God is getting glory and God demands and commands that He should get glory. And there's no greater glory that He can get than the salvation of a sinner. Because when a sinner gets saved, it does not involve the work of man. I understand that God uses man's voice and God uses man's hands. I understand that we are the avenue and we are the instrument that God uses to give the gospel. But the saving power never has and never will come from man. It comes from the Lord. And when the Lord reaches down and makes a sinner a saint and takes someone who is dead and makes them alive and takes someone who is in darkness and brings them into light, God gets the ultimate glory because it is His work. It is a work that man cannot do. So the purpose of the church is for God to get glory and to give God glory. The ultimate way to do that is to see sinners saved by God's grace. There are many other ways to give God glory, but that is the best way for God to get glory is for some sinner to get saved. Brother Philip, when I got saved 31 years ago, God got glory and He's been getting glory for 31 years now. I've been giving Him glory. My parents have been giving Him glory. My children now are giving Him glory because I'm saved by the grace of God. Do you understand that? So God gets glory when someone gets saved. They'd forgotten the purpose of the church. They'd forgotten the plan of the church. What is the plan of the church? It is to, it is to be a charitable organization. No, that is not the plan of the church. What is the plan of the church? It is to make sure hungry children are fed. No, that is not the plan of the church. There's nothing wrong with that. What is the plan of the church? It's to make sure that we build nice buildings and keep good grounds. That is not the plan of the church. The plan of the church is to go out with the gospel, preach the word of God, have sinners saved, come into the house of God, worship Him, and give glory again, give glory to God. They'd forgotten the purpose. They'd forgotten the plan. They'd even forgotten the power of the church. It says the church of the Laodiceans as if they have any power, as if they have any ability within themselves. Hey, listen, Harvest, it would do you well just to remember you are nothing without Him. And the only thing you ever will be is what He's done in your life. Don't ever think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Amen? I am nothing outside of the grace of God. I say, yea, I am even less than nothing outside of the grace of God and everything that I am or ever will be, I am by His good grace. I never want to forget His power. Never want to forget what the power of the church is. And that is the power of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel, the power of the blood, the power of the word of God. We could go on and on about power. They had forgotten because they had taken possession of the church. Secondly, I want you to notice the person that came to the church. Verse number 14. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. I like that. I'm going to read on in just a minute and get to the true and faithful witness and get on to the beginning of the creation of God. But I just like that. Amen. I remember when I read that, I think of S.M. Locke. Cridge. Some of you have heard S.M. Lockridge uh, preach, and and uh, he preached on on just he preached on Christ one time, and he started calling out the names of God and the names of Christ and all that he was, and and, and he was a, a black preacher, and man alive could he preach! And I was listening to that one time, and I used to have a tape of it. And he was preaching, and he got to that one part, and he said, "He is the Ed man." And he just paused. I said, man, I like it. Amen. Hey, who, who is it that came to this church? Who is it that brought a message? Who is it that's preaching now? It is the amen. It was a person of authority. A person who is the so be it. A person who you cannot argue against. Listen, when God shows up at your house and tells you you're wrong, you cannot argue with that. He is the amen. When God takes the word of God and shows you the error of your ways, you cannot argue with that. He he is the amen. You say, well, I don't like it. You don't have to like it. He is the amen. You say, well, I don't agree with you. You don't have to agree with it. He is the amen. I know some of you are going to find this a very, very shocking thing, but let me tell you today, God did not consult your opinion when He wrote His Word. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Now don't let that disturb you too awfully much. Some of you just had a shock. You said, you mean he didn't write his word for me? He wrote his word for you, but not in the sense that you take it sometimes. He didn't consult your opinion. He didn't consult your life. He didn't say, well, what are they going to want to hear? Or what are they going to want me to say? He wrote his word. He pinned it down. It is forever settled in heaven. Never will be changed. Never has been changed. We could get in right now and start preaching about versions of the Bible and changes in the Bible. It's not necessary. Amen. God's word is settled in heaven. God's word settled in heaven and it has not changed. And we have the word of God in our hands today. And we boldly and proudly proclaim the word of God and say this. He is the amen. The so be it. The final word. When you're having a discussion with the Lord, he should always win. Some of you not learn that. I'll be honest with you, I still struggle with it from time to time. But when you're having a discussion with the Lord, He should always win. By the way, He will always win. Sometimes it may just hurt you a lot more to find that out. But I have discussions with the Lord and I don't think there's anything unhealthy or wrong with having discussions with the Lord. Sometimes the Lord begins to speak to me through His Word. I read God's Word. I'm going to be honest with you, I've said this many times, I have troubles with some portions of Scripture. There are some portions of Scripture that bother me. I don't disagree with them. I love them and I thank the Lord, but they bother me because when I read them, they correct me. I read them and I realize, wait a second, God's Word says this, but my life says this. It is not my opportunity or my responsibility to talk to God and say, God, I've got a problem with your Word. No, I go and have a discussion with Him. Say, number one, Lord, is this really what you're telling me? Is this what your Word is saying? When we have that, we counsel together and He tells me this is exactly what I am saying. This is what God's Word says. All right, Lord. Second thing, if this is what you say, then you really are pointing this out in my life. Is that right? Yes, I'm really pointing that out in your life. Well, Lord, if you're pointing that out in my life and that is what you say, let me just take a wild guess. You're not wrong, are you? The Lord says, no, I'm not wrong. So if you're not wrong, then I'm definitely not right. That's right, you're not right. I know you don't have conversations with the Lord like this. You're more spiritual than I am. You simply just read it and change your life and go on about your business because you're, you're a greater giant than I am. I understand that, but I, I'm not. I, I struggle with things sometimes and I have to converse with the Lord, but He always wins the argument. I've even come to Him, Brother Ken, and said, Lord, I know you said this, but didn't you mean this? And I try to ease it up on me a little bit. Come on and help me out a little bit. Don't leave me out here as the only worldly carnal person that reads the Bible. Help me out a little bit. You know there's areas in the Bible that, that, that you struggle with too. And I read it and say, Lord, surely you meant this. And he says, no, I assure you, I didn't mean that. And so at the end of the conversation, I just have to come to the conclusion, Lord, I'm wrong. You're right. Show me how to get my life to where your word says it ought to be. And then we are having a business meeting and he is doing all the voting and it turns out real well. Somebody say amen. The person that came is a person of authority. He is the amen. It is a person of judgment that comes up. He says he is the faithful and true witness. He comes with an account against them. He, and we'll get into that account in just a moment. But he comes with a word against them. It's not going to be a favorable message. It's not going to be a good message. It's not going to make them feel good. They're not going to leave with warm and fuzzy feelings all over them. He is coming with a message of judgment. He is coming with a message that is harsh. He's coming with a message that points their faults out. He's coming with a message that tells them they have failed, but they cannot argue with him because he is the true and faithful witness. Everything he says is right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So see a person of authority, a person of judgment, and then a person of power. He said, the beginning of the creation of God. If you go to John chapter number 1, you find that without Him was not anything made that was made. He is the creator of all things. Two great displays of the power of God. And both of them, according to the Word of God, Jesus 
was involved in. One is the power of creation, that is great power. How he spoke into existence everything that is. I do believe the Genesis account of creation. I do believe that God created the world by speaking into existence the things that he spoke into existence. I do believe that God made everything that is. Amen. I understand there's man made things, but they had to start from something. And their original uh, material they started with had to come from something that God made. God made everything, I believe, in His creative power. And according to John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That is speaking of Jesus Christ and His role in creation as well. So that is great power. Second power that amazes me me in the Word of God is the power of the resurrection. It is one thing that he had power to raise the dead, but he had power to raise himself. Amen. It is one thing you understand. I could come over to Ryan here and Ryan, I'm picking you because Brother Heath, uh, well, you'll see why I'm not picking Brother Heath, All right, I can come over to Ryan right here and I can easily grab Ryan and I can pick him up. I have the power to do that. I have the power to raise him. But you understand I have no ability within myself to raise me off of the ground and hold me there. I am absent of that power. It is one thing for me to say I have power to lift him, but another thing to say I have power to lift me. But Jesus said not only do I have the power to raise Lazarus from the dead, but I have the power to raise myself from the dead. And here is the reason why. Not because Jesus believed in the resurrection, not because Jesus understood the resurrection, but because Jesus said I am the resurrection and the life. That power amazes me. And this person that came to the church of Laodicea, and and remember this because we're going to get there in just a moment. Very important you remember who it was. He is the amen. He had authority. He is the true and faithful witness. He had judgment. And he is the beginning of the creation of God. He had power. This one, this person that came to the church. Thirdly today, we see the possession of the church and the person that came to the church. I want you to notice the preaching that came to the church. Now here's where the message gets a little bit sketchy and a little bit hard. Here's where the message gets a little bit ugly, if you will, because this is not the message they were desiring to hear. It is not even the message they thought they were going to hear. I can imagine if we had the name out on the road and it said uh, First Baptist Church of Laodiceans, or maybe Laodicean Baptist Church out on the sign, I can imagine people coming in on a Sunday morning like this and sitting down in their pew with a smile on their face and the song service coming on and them raising their hands and shouting, Hey man, glory to God, hallelujah. Perhaps if there's time for testimony, there would even be several in the church at Laodicea that would stand up and testify and they would brag on the goodness of the Lord. But yet that is not the message they were receiving. It was not a commendation that God is giving them. This amen, the Lord Jesus, the true and faithful witness, the beginning of the creation of God, had brought a message to them that they were not expecting. And I want you to get the message today. In this message, this preaching that came to the church, we see it as preaching of divine knowledge. In verse number 15, he said, I know thy works. That's the first thing that made him nervous. That is the first thing that made them nervous. When they came to church that morning, they were not expecting to hear the preacher say, I know who you are. He, they, they were not expecting. Can you imagine when he stepped to the pulpit, they said, where's our normal pastor? Wait a second, we didn't vote on nobody else to, to preach this morning. We didn't vote on nobody else to come to the pulpit. We don't even recognize him. Who is he? And he stands up and says, I am the amen. And they go, mm-hmm. he said, I am the true and faithful witness. And they say, oh my said, I'm the beginning of the creation of God. And they said, this is not going to turn out good. And they're sitting there and he begins with this, I know thy works. And immediately condemnation and conviction begins to settle in on the church at Laodicea because guess what? They knew their works too. 
Amen. And when God said, I know thy works, it brought up something in them that was not comfortable. And this morning, the Holy Ghost in many of your lives has already begun to stick His finger on some things. And He's already begun to reveal to you that He knows some things about you. And He knows you're not the spiritual giant that you think you are. And He knows you're not as right as you say you are. And He knows what is hiding behind the smile and what is hiding behind the raised hands and what is behind the, the nod and the amens and all he knows what's hiding there because it is a message of divine knowledge. I'm glad he knows me. I'm glad he knows what I need. I'm glad he knows when to tear me apart and when to build me back. I'll be honest with you, one of the things I miss so much now that I'm pastor of a church is the steady flow of preaching that I used to receive. I get to go to meetings from time to time. This week has been wonderful because I've been able to go to church and just sit and listen to preaching and it so helped me and, and it's not all been comfortable. It's not all been good. There's been some messages that have torn me apart. Messages that have taken things out of my life. Messages that have put things into my life. And I bless the Lord for it. But I miss so much Brother David standing up. I'd sit right there about where Chase is. And Brother David would get up and he'd preach. And when he got up to preach, the Holy Ghost would say, Hey Mark, Biddy, I know thy works. I know where you're at. And I'm sending you a message right now. And he would take the Word of God and begin to surgically cut things and remove it from my life. I thank the Lord that He knows where I am. I've grown to love the fact He even knows where I'm wrong. Used to bother me, Brother Ken. Used to bother me that He knew where I was wrong because I wanted to be wrong. Hey man, some of you today, it really bothers you that the Lord knows when you're wrong because there's something down in you that still wants to be wrong. But I can say, and I please understand, I'm not saying this to lift me up at all. I'm telling you the honesty of my heart. I have no desire to be wrong. I want to be right with Him. I want to be clean. I want to be close to Him. I want to have an intimate relationship with Him. I have grown to love the fact that He knows when I'm wrong. Because, Brother Ken, I don't want to be wrong. There is something in me that longs to be right with God. I long to be clean. I long to have fellowship with Him. I long for that relationship to be as close as possible. So when I am wrong, He comes to me and says, I know thy works. And something within me, in the midst of all the condemnation that comes with those words, there is still a ray of hope down inside me. It says if He knows my works and He's still visiting me, then He can fix me. And I bless the Lord, He can fix me. It was a message of divine knowledge. He said, I know thy works. It was a message not only of divine knowledge, it was preaching that defined a condition. Notice the contrast in perspective today that we find here. Turn with me for just a moment in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 9. This is the message he's given the church at Smyrna. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty... But then, in parentheses, he says, but thou art rich. Now, the church at Smyrna has said, man, we're broke. We're poor. Everything has been stripped from us. We're being persecuted. We have nothing to offer God. And the Lord shows up and says, I know your poverty. I know what you're saying. But hey, Smyrna, you are rich. That's what God said about them. They said they were poor. God said, but ye are rich. Notice the message he comes with here. In, uh, we'll, we'll just skip down and read it. Verse number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There's a contrast in perspective. You see, the church at Smyrna said we are poor. And God said you are rich. The church at Laodicea said we are rich and have need of nothing nothing and God said you're wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked can I tell you it really doesn't matter what your opinion of you is his opinion is what makes the difference 
Some of you come to church this morning and say, I am rich and have need of nothing. And you came in, sat on the church pew, and please understand, I'm not, I, I, this is not mean preaching, this is truthful, and this is what is needed in today's hour. This is a burden of my heart. Some of you came in this morning, as I have in the past many times, and sat on the pew and said, God, move me if you can. If you want to really show your power, then show how you can move me, because I don't want to be moved. I don't want to be changed. You came in and said, my life is complete, my life is happy, and God says something different. You're saying I'm rich and have need of nothing, and God now in your heart is saying you are not rich, you do have need, you are poor and blind and naked and wretched and miserable. And I tell you, it's God's opinion that matters, not yours. Some of you though, you came into church this morning, you've been down, you've been discouraged, and you've been in the valley for a while, and you've been thinking, I sure am poor. Oh God, I've got nothing to offer you. And the Holy Ghost has slipped in beside you this morning and say, you're richer than you think you are. And He started to remind you of the blood of Jesus and the love of Jesus and, 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 and redemption and heaven. And you're beginning now to realize, hey, you know what? I'm not near as poor as I thought I was when I came to the house of God. Some of you are finding out you're much poorer than you thought you were when you came to the house of God. There's a contrast in perspective. It is preaching that defined a condition. He said they were wretched. That means worthless. Can I tell you, when you're not right with God, you're worthless. <sighs> worthless. I know that's not popular, and I know that's not real shouting ground. I understand that. We'll get to shouting ground in a moment, if you'll just hang with me. Wretched means Worthless. Some of you in the condition you are this morning are worthless as a servant of God. I know because I've been there. I have been worthless. Perhaps I even am now. I trust not. I try not to be the judge of that, Brother Ken. I'm just going to go with his perspective. Amen. Some of you came in because of sin in your life because of the coldness in your life, because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold, you're not burning up, but you're not out. You're just sitting there. You're just enduring the Christian life. And He sends a message to let you know you're worthless. What kind of preacher is a wretched preacher? He's worthless. Hey, man. What kind of preacher is a preacher who's not right with God? He is a worthless preacher. I remember areas of my life that I went through and times of my life that I went through where I really, just because of the condition of my own soul, I was absolutely worthless in the service of the King. Some of you came to church this morning, you're worthless. Hang with me. Don't you get mad. Don't you get upset. And don't turn me off because there's hope in, the minute, in a minute. We gotta, we gotta, we've got to get the diagnosis before we can get to the cure, okay? Some of you came, you're wretched. That means worthless. He said, you're miserable. That means very unhappy and to be pitied. Some of you hiding behind that smile on your face this morning is a miserable, miserable life. And here's what God says, you're so miserable, I pity you. Can you imagine being pitied by God because of your miserable condition? Some of you, you put a bright smile on, you came in, you shook my hand with a smile on your face, you said, Pastor, how are you this morning? Boy, it's good to be in God's house. And behind that smile was a miserable Christian because you're lukewarm. Amen. Amen. You see, if you were cold, you wouldn't be just absolutely miserable. You just have the wrong happiness. And if you were hot for God, you wouldn't be miserable because you'd have the joy of the Lord. But you're not hot and you're not cold. You're just lukewarm. You're stagnant. You're stale. And God says, you know what you are? You're miserable and I pity you. I pity the condition you're in. Then he said you're poor. It means reduced to begging. There's perhaps no greater shame than having to beg. Is that right? Some have made a good career out of it down at IHOP. IHOP's not there anymore, but it used to be an IHOP right there in Buckhead where Roswell Road comes in. We would eat there every now and then. There was a guy came up to me one morning. I come out from breakfast and he came up to me and said, man, can you spare some change or a dollar? Man, I'm starving. I, you know, I'm, I'm down on my luck and everything. I said, you know what? I had some change left over from my breakfast. I gave it to him. 
maybe a dollar twenty-five or something like that. He took off across the parking lot and went down a set of steps on the end of the parking lot. I thought, I'll just head over there and see where he's going. And I looked over the steps there. He was going down like this in front of me. I looked over and he pulled a wad of money out like that and put my dollar bill in the midst of it. He had made a living out of begging. I know other people that have done that. We've seen cases like that before where, uh, where, where people are, are making money. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how they get beyond the shame of it. There, that is a shameful place to be. And there's nothing that attacks the pride more of a person than being reduced to the place of begging. And that's where the Lord said they were at Laodicea. He said they were in a shameful place. They've been reduced to begging. Then he said, you're blind. Word blind means, of course, the literal meaning of, of can't see, but it also means to be in a smoke or to be in a fog. Some of you, you're in a fog this morning. You're in a smoke. You can't see clearly the things of God. You can't see clearly the direction of God. You can't see clearly the Word of God. You can't see clearly the will of God. You're in a fog this morning. And He's sending you a message today saying, hey, you think you're okay. You think you have need of nothing. You think you're rich. But the problem is you're living in a fog. And the, the sunlight of God's love is not shown on your heart in a while because of this foggy condition you're in. He said, you're blind. And then he said, you're naked. That's to be unclothed, unprotected, open to view, and defenseless. That's what God said the church at Laodicea was. Some have said, Pastor, I have need of nothing. I am rich. And God says, you're naked. God sees it all. You're open to view and you're not hiding anything. And you're defenseless. You have no armor on. You have no way of fighting against the attacks that are coming your way. And you really are, as the Word of God describes it, you really are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Can I just tell you what a lukewarm Christian is? A lukewarm Christian is a compromiser. A lukewarm Christian is calloused. The things of God don't move you anymore. There was a time when the choir would sing and a, a certain song or the songs we sang this morning, there was something that stirred within you, something that happened within you. There was joy that sprung up from you. There was tears that would come from your eyes and you were visually moved and you were emotionally stirred and spiritually moved by what was taking place in the house of God and now you are cold and you're callous. You do not feel the stirring of the Holy Ghost. You do not feel the stirring in the Word of God. You don't feel the stirring in worship any longer. You are in a lukewarm condition and you're callous to the things of God and God pities you because of it. Let me say this as tenderly as I can. Some of you, if God doesn't do something in your life, if you don't allow, excuse me, if you don't allow God to do something in your life, in six months, you will not be at Harvest Baptist Church. And you will not leave this church to go to a church with stronger standards. You will not leave this church to go to a church that stands more strongly on the Bible. You will not leave this church to find a church with better worship. You will not leave this church and go to a church that preaches harder because what you're looking for is fed by your flesh. And when you leave this church, and I'm telling you this as your pastor because I love you enough to tell you this. When you leave this church being led and driven by your flesh, you will find a church that satisfies your flesh, not your spirit. And a church that satisfies your flesh is not a place to raise your family. Amen. Laodicea, Laodicea, you're wretched, miserable. Poor, blind, and naked. It's an awful place to be. Lukewarm Christians are callous. They're compromises. They're complacent. They're just, they're just in a condition. They're in a place. They're not going to move. They're not going to advance. They're not going to back up. They're just sitting. They're just sitting. You know, people that just genuinely get out are easier to reach than some of you are. Amen. Here's the reason. They got out, but they're moving. You are planted. 
right. in your condition. Right. And you've grown roots down. And those roots are not easily broken and not easily right. dug up. Right. And God's trying to send preaching and a message from God to loosen the roots. To get you drawn back to a place where you ought to be. To get you drawn back to a place where you can serve Him. Get you drawn back to a place where you'll have true happiness and true joy and the true peace of God again. And you're harder to reach than someone that just quits on God and goes out into the world. Because they haven't grown roots, Brother Ken. They're moving around too much. They're running too hard to grow roots. So when you do catch them, they're not planted. Problem is a lot of you are planted this morning. If God were allow us to see your spiritual condition... There would be roots coming out of you wrapping around that church pew. Sucking you down into the church pew to a complacent life to where you'll do nothing for God. You say, well, I'm just waiting for the rapture. Are you? Are you waiting for the rapture? You're not waiting for the rapture. You're just waiting for an excuse to get out. They're complacent. Lukewarm Christians are camouflaged. Amen. Brother Jody, you can help me with this. Right now, it's the time of year where you're, you're, you're checking stands and you're checking where the deer are running and doing all kinds of things like that. And Brother Jody, he's a hunter. and he, He's a hunter in the hunting sense. I'm a hunter in the killing sense. I don't really just go to hunt. I go to kill. I want to kill something. Jody can go hang in, the, in a tree for hours on time and just be happy watching deer run around until, you know, the bullwinkle comes out. I'm not nearly as happy. You know, about the only time I'm real happy after hunting is when I'm cleaning the deer. That's because I like killing more than hunting. Brother Jody's a hunter. Right now, Brother Jody will walk into the woods and set his stands and get his trees ready and set cameras and watch all that. He'll go in a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt right now. But you come the middle of September on opening morning, and I know Brother Jody, he's going to have camouflage socks on and they're going to be in his boots and it ain't even going to matter. <laughs> camouflage boots on, camouflage everywhere else, camouflage pants, camouflage shirt. He's going to have a camouflage hat or a boggin or some kind on. And then he's going to pull out this makeup. It's the only way a man ever should wear makeup. Amen. amen. Some of you fellas could have said amen right now. Now you got me worried. Amen. Brother Jody will take out that little makeup kit. And it'll have black and brown and green. And he'll start mixing up and smearing it on his face. I've seen pictures. He's scary looking when he goes in the woods. You know, why that, you know why he'll go through all that trouble? You know why he'll do all of that? Paint his face and all of the clothing and, and the, the, then he'll mask his scent to make sure he doesn't smell like a human. I mean, he's going to do, he's going to go all out. Why? Because his desire is to disappear when he gets in the woods. You know what some of you have become? You've become camouflaged. Your desire is to disappear in the world. And the only way to disappear in the world is to begin to dress like them, to begin to talk like them, to begin to listen to what they listen to, watch the things they watch, do the things that they do, because your desire is to fit in. God never has saved anybody to fit into this world. Amen. And people that desire to be right with God do not desire to fit in with this world. You become camouflaged. Lukewarm Christians are carnal. Lukewarm Christians are comfortable. And here's what God said. He, he showed the disgust. His preaching revealed the disgust of God. He said in verse number, uh, verse number 16, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Some of you read that and you say, oh, that just means he got a mouthful of it and, and spit it back out. No, that's not what it means. That means he got a mouthful of it and it caused him to vomit. That's what the word literally means, to vomit. It is not something that was just distasteful to his mouth. It was something that churned his very insides. And that is your spiritual condition in the eyes of a holy God. 
Laodicea. We're living in Laodicea now. We, we got to hurry. We got to hurry. And I'll wrap up as quickly as I can. We have seen the preaching that came to the church, the person that came to the church, the possession of the church. Let me mention now the possibility of the church. This is where the hope comes in. This is where the glory comes in, okay? So if you've been looking for an opportunity to shout, we're fixing to get to a good reason to shout. Verse number 20, go with me now. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is the possibility that the church has because of the, 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 the invitation that God has given us. I want you to notice this possibility rests in the person at the door. It rests in the person at the door. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He said, it's not a common man out there. It's not someone that cannot help you. It's not someone that cannot meet your needs. I want you to know it is I that is standing at the door. It is the great I am, the one that never changes, the one who can meet all your needs, the one who can restore your condition, the one who can forgive you, the one who can redeem you, the one who can make you clean again, the one who can give you power again, the one who can make you a servant again, the one who can make you happy again, the one who can give you peace again. I am at the door. What a great possibility. Isn't it amazing in the condition the church at Laodicea? And by the way, this is not a passage to lost people. This is a message to the church. This is a message to saved people. And he said, hey church, I'm telling you, I am at the door. I'm waiting and longing and I'm knocking. I want to come into you. I want to fix you. I want to revive you. I want to help you. I I want to put my touch on you. I want to give you my power. I'm standing at the door, patiently knocking, and I will come in if you will open to me. What a possibility the church has because of the person at the door. It rests in the person at the door, but the possibility hinges upon the people inside. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice... And open the door. He said, I've got all your problems right here fixed. I'm at the door. There is a remedy. His name is Jesus. And he said, I've got, all, I've got the answer to all your problems and I'm at the door. But I'm not going to come in unless I'm invited. I wasn't going to do this, but I want you to turn with me to Song of Solomon. I believe it is chapter, chapter number 5. We'll start in verse number 16 of chapter number 4. It says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Okay, now she reaches out to Solomon and says, Come in to your garden. Verse number one, he says, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Now he came in, but apparently he did not come in alone. He said, drink, O oh friends. There's some sort of gathering going on here. Remember, she is desiring for him to come into her. He comes into the garden, he says, but then he had friends with him. And they're drinking and communing together. Apparently during this time, she gets tired of waiting. What does she do? She goes to bed. She said in verse number 2, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. She's gotten tired of waiting, apparently. She's gone in, she's retired to bed now. He knocks at the door, she recognizes the sound of his voice, but she begins to make excuses now. She says, I'm, I've already taken my coat off. I'm already in the bed. I've already washed my feet. If I were to get up, I'd have to rewash. I'd have to uh, put on some attire. I, I, I can't come to the door. But then there's a longing in her because in verse number four, 
Well, listen to verse number four. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. And let me give you just an illustration of this for just a moment. In those days, there were no locks. Doors were not to keep people out. They were to keep animals out, perhaps keep the weather out a little bit. And there were not door locking mechanisms. What you had, you had either a leather strap or some kind of wood latch inside the door, and you had a hole there. And when you'd get home, you'd reach in that hole and just flip the latch and open the door. She said, I saw my beloved's hand by the hole in the door. She said, I knew he was there. You know what he could have done? He could have come in. He could have reached in. He could have unlatched the door and he could have come in. But Brother Kenny would not. He stood at the door and knocked with all ability to come in. Let me tell you, the Lord could come in on you. He could. He has access. He has the power just to bust in and take control. But instead, as a gentleman, he knocks at the door, waiting, waiting for you to open. The Bible says she rose up, and I'm hurrying through it now. She rose up to go to the door. When she went to the door, he was gone. He waited patiently. He could have come in, but because she did not open the door, he removed himself. Some of you, you say, well, I'd get right with God if He'd just spring on in me and force it on me. Some of you, you've even looked and you've seen His hand at the hole of the door. You know He's there. But He will not come in unless you open the door. I hear, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, listen to this. The possibility rests in the person at the door. The possibility hinges on the response of those within the door. This possibility presents communion. He said, and I will come into him and sup with him. I will sup with him. That's the Lord coming in to your abode and supping with you. Now, Brother Ken, if, if, I, if you were to invite me to your house and I come in, I would be coming in to eat with you, to eat with you. But then if I were to say to someone else, come in and eat with me, you know what I've done? I've not only communed, I've taken up a dwelling. Now I've taken the position of inviting people. This is what he offers. He offers not only communion, he offers a continuance. He says, if any man will open the door, I will come into him and sup with him. But then he said, and he with me. You see, the only way for him to be able to say he with me is if he now has taken a boat in that place. And he now has the right to give an invitation. Here's what's happened if you'll open the door. If you'll open the door, he'll come in to you. He'll come in and he'll fix the things. He'll deal with your heart. But also he will take up a residence there. And he will reign on the throne of your heart so that then he becomes the one with the invitation Come to me and sup with me. He, he's not interested in visiting with you. He's interested in taking up the throne of your heart and dwelling on the throne of your heart. That is his interest this morning. Stand to our feet with every head bowed, every eye closed.